Good evening, everybody, and we have a real treat for you tonight. And the reason it's such a real treat is because if you like this lady, and I know you will, because we uh, love her from having spent a little bit of time with her over the last month, um, she's local. And maybe the marshal even have her back to do one of her longer shows. And um, you will be there in attendance because where did you see her first? And can solo arts heal? So it's a real pleasure um, for me tonight to, to welcome Lisa Schneiderman. Schneiderman, I'm going to call her Lise. Uh, she also goes by Aide. Uh, AD, and she will explain that momentarily. So, uh, Lise, come on in and and uh, say hello. Hello. What an honor it is to be here, and I'm so looking forward to our conversation, Rick. Me too. Me too. So, I I was looking into your background a little bit. And I know that we have got a story to tell. I mean, you are just perfect for this show because the show's all about how we use the arts to heal. And that's your story. But that only came in halfway through your life. So there's a lot of story <laughs> before we get to how the arts happen. Now, I know that part of that story is that um, you were very much into theater and, um, and music and singing um, when you were growing up. Is that true? Yes, I've always had music and drama in my life from being a kid acting in children's theater, solos on stage, performing in junior high and high school musicals, playing, even playing violin, I remember in fourth grade, sax in fifth grade. So, but it wasn't until I was an adult and I was going through a big life transition, actually a divorce at the time that I actually discovered my muse when I was reinventing myself. And I had an opportunity to do that by being a lead singer in a cover band in 2002 for a few years. And I started writing my own material between 2003 and 2005, and then took on the musical identity of AD, which is my artist name. And AD just interestingly means song in Greek mythology. She was the first muse of song. And I wanted this affiliation with inspiration to remind myself to be inspired and to continually inspire. So that's a little bit of that story. And little did I know that years later, this theme of muse would really be so central to my own life path and purpose. Yeah, but you missed out a big bit there. You never told us that you were really a scientist. You were one uh, of those scientists who happened to be yeah, a musician I, as well. Exactly. I had these two hats. So at the same time that I was moving forward this, this career as a ED, I was also an environmental scientist, as you know, and I worked for about 10 years to protect California's coast from the impacts of water quality. So that was my passion was watersheds and water quality. Yeah, that's the start of it. <laughs> and, and, and how about this, how about this cover band? Was this, an, was this an all, all women, all girls band or what? Tell, no, tell us. Okay, there was a program, still is, called Bandworks, and it matched people who wanted to sing and play together. And we yeah. had a match and played together for a few years and called ourselves Tuesday's Alibi, if I remember at the time. So that's where it started. And they started playing songs that I wrote, my original songs, which really gave me kind of a high and sparked me to write more. And that's why, you know, AED was formed. Okay, now that was around 2006, so we suddenly rocketed <laughs> forward a good few years there, right? Yeah. And just as IED was forming, or well, very soon after, you got um, nailed with uh, what I'll easily call the matter what. Yes. <laughs> the matter what, because that was a name you came up with, but tell us about what the matter what what what's what with the matter what <laughs> i'm gonna take us back to 2008 so picture okay. yourself 
it is six weeks before you're getting married. You're yes. about to go on tour to promote your first full album and you're working yeah. full time as an yeah. environmental scientist. Imagine yeah. you get a skin rash out of nowhere and you get an appointment with a dermatologist and you expect that they're going to give you, he's going to give you some cream. And instead he tells you after he takes a look that you have a rare unpronounceable disease and he refers you to a rheumatologist and you're only 35 years old. So that mm. was in April of 2008. And the disease, as you know, is dermatal myositis. It is a progressive right. muscle weakness, autoimmune disease that affects my skin, muscles, energy, stamina, strength, mobility. Uh, and I have been navigating and battling this rare disabling illness for nearly 14 years, and I'm still dealing with those challenges. And interestingly, I want to share this, that I often share my story because we came on today talking about a journey uh, that, you know, is promoted as this journey going from surviving to thriving to grieving. And it's really interesting to me because my story, the way I have had it in the past, is that I became this light in the darkness to other people. And I also was using creativity to help, as you know, express and heal. But I really didn't see that part of my story is actually going from surviving to thriving, mostly mm -hmm. through this endless medical roller coaster and these physical transformations that happened mm -hmm. and that to transpiring through transcending through creating art and attitude and to this missing piece that I call grieving. And that's because the last 14 years have been filled with a roller coaster of therapies, you know, more than like 269 doctor visits, lots of experimental Ooh. treatments, immunosuppressive drugs, infections, hospitalizations, and monthly infusions to allow me mm -hmm. to survive and to allow a quality of life. Um, mm -hmm. And so I mention all this and the worst of it was a flare in 2010, where I was hospitalized for nearly a month with complete muscle weakness due to a flare. It rendered me unable to move, then confined me to a wheelchair and forced me to undergo, you know, grueling rehab for months to relearn the basics, how to sit, how to stand, how to walk, mm -hmm. and eventually mm -hmm. how to play and sing again. So I mm -hmm. went from complete independence to total dependence required home care from bathers, physical and occupational therapists that would come to the house, rely on family and friends for, you know, shuttling me to infusions and learn this new baseline, you know, that involved wheelchairs and walkers and canes and, you know, bath seats and ramps and all these things um, and daily shakes and, you know, shower benches. And I mention all of this because the only thing I could really seek to do was not be in that space. Okay, now we are going to watch three segments very soon. And would you like to just tell us a little bit about what to expect here, at least for the first segment, and then maybe you can tell us a little bit about the second segment. Yeah, so when I got out of the, out of the hospital in 2010, all I could do really was create to express. And honestly, it was this compulsive need and so one of the songs I had written in 2010 was Fairy Tale Love. Um, and it sparked me to actually create my first musical story on audiobook called Is Love a Fairy Tale as well, that I also released the same year. Mm -hmm. And really what this, what you're going to see is that this is this, a tale that was recorded in, I think, July of 2010. And it tells of just what one girl would do for her happy ever after. Okay. Well, we're going to watch that right now and then move into a couple more segments. What if the prince 
Never kiss beauty's lips She might still be sleeping all alone Oh, 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 oh Give me fairy tale love Oh, 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 oh Cause it's what I'm dreaming of Oh, 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 and a prince to call my own Oh, I would should throw a frog at the wall To turn him into tall and handsome When will the guy who leads a charmed life Cruise my kingdom for his perfect bride? Oh, 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 oh Give me fairy tale love Oh, 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 oh. I've been told to stop believing, stop deceiving Why be full of foolishness and wishful dreaming? They would have me buy love come so easily But I will never stop believing life is ours to dream and apple bite. So tell, tell us a little bit about the next one that's, that we're going to see. Yes. Uh, would you like to show your video? So we, we're going to move right into the next video, as I understand it. So just tell us, introduce that video. Excellent. Okay. So this is actually after an unexpected part of my journey was in order to keep my songwriter's dream alive, after I could no longer perform live, uh, it took me from writing songs to creating pop albums, to creating full length musicals on audiobooks and then adapting them to stage plays. And after doing Is a Love a Fairy Tale, I was so hooked and excited by the musical theater niche that I just wanted to continue. So these are two of the audiobooks that I adapted to stage plays that had readings. And the first one is What Are Dreams Made Of from 2013, had a stage reading with a youth theater in the Bay Area. And the second one you'll see is Do You Believe in Magic? It is the evening of December 26th in the magical kingdom of Wonderkin. Oh, what's a dream? Is it a whisper wish? Or is your heart beat? Oh, what's a dream? Is it a fancy trip? A trip your mind takes? And is it a window to see?
so I got inspired again to write and the next one was called Do You Believe in Magic? I wanted to revisit Aedes' adventures in Wonder Haven and this time the story revolves around that the magical kingdom of Wonder Haven is under a malicious curse and magic is dissipating and Aedes the Muse thinks she has no use of more magic but she's the only one who can save the kingdom. So I produced a staged reading using the cast from this musical. And in May of 2015 in San Francisco, we put on a reading. The kingdom's in a frenzy, the kingdom's in a veil. We think we should do something before the kingdom fails. Unthinkable, unthinkable, the unthinkable has happened when the haven's gonna fail. Unthinkable. She was uh, really so the next video is a song I wrote in 2011 that was part of the Skeletons of the Muse album. And this is interesting because it was after a fan confided in me that he had a, dis uh, a debilitating disease. And I imagined the world through his lens. And then I partnered with Cure JM. And JM is juvenile myositis. It's the kids who have the same disease that I have. And I saw them as superheroes and as warriors. And I worked with a company who created the superhero generator. And I had kids send in drawings and poems that are featured. So this is perfect day. get into the surviving part I just want to ask about the production of these um where did the where did the graphics come from where did the animations come from are you partly responsible for all of this yes <laughs> yes and uh, it depends on which video you mean <laughs> Fairy tale love took its own trajectory I ended up working with an animator and then finding, uh, actually, I think it was found footage from 1934. That was the Betty Boop uh, wow. stuff, stuff and that style that that uh, I think there was unraveling of of, of the dress with Betty mm -hmm. Boop and Cinderella. Mm -hmm. So I found mm -hmm. footage. I worked with an animator. That's an example for fairy tale. Uh, and for the Cure JM, as I noted, I worked with the, a, a generator, like a company that made these superheroes. So it was really neat for the kids because they could go in and design their own superhero. And I just thought that was really lovely. So Cool. So one of the things that you said to me when we talked before the show was that you see a real difference um, between the stage when you have active disease and the stage when you have chronic disease. 
So now that we're talking about surviving, which is the first stage of your journey, talk to us a little bit about this active versus chronic and how that affected you and, and how it affected you in the context of creating. Yeah, it's a great question. I don't necessarily think uh, active chronic, I think acute and chronic. Acute, sorry, my fault. It's okay, not a, wor not a worry, but um, acute and chronic, meaning to me, when you are dealing with your basic needs, uh, survival, so to speak, the, the pandemic is a perfect example. At the top of the bad pandemic, 2020 hits, you know, we get these quarantines, everybody is rushing to get toilet paper, all these things. It is not the time for most people to be open to a creative flow. So for me, survival was survival. I was not creating because my energy had to be used specifically to move my head. Like literally, you know what I mean? All my energy yeah. to, to sit up. Mm -hmm. There wasn't much left, right? Once mm -hmm. I was through that hump and what helped me get through that hump is creativity. So for me, I found that uh, uh, like along my twisting spiral, you know, uh, staircase of a journey, creating fantasy, bright, light, happy, uplifting albums, musicals, songs, all these things help me escape and counter the day-to-day -day darkness. And I'm going to be really specific that there's, there's some positive things that happen with creativity. It helped me not focus on being sick. It, mm -hmm. it gave me some purpose and identity and meaning. And it reminds me that I'm not my illness. I always say that to people. We are not our illnesses. Mm -hmm. We still have work, mm -hmm. and contribution and value. And as I say, like my artist identity, there's still something there when I'm creating, especially mm -hmm. when I could no longer move my muscles and lost my independence. So mm -hmm. I also have to acknowledge something besides the creativity. I know we're focused on it, but that is huge, which is what's instrumental also to my healing is that I don't go this alone. And I emphasize how much support of an amazing life partner, such as my husband, Dave, who's my pillar and my rock, my family, my friends, the myositis community, the music community, my fans, mm -hmm. all of this was bolstering and supporting me you know, uh, cheerleading me, mentoring in recovery and, and healing and wellness. Uh, and so I don't want to go, you know, without saying that it isn't only delving into the art, you know, but it's acknowledging that it's attitude and it, it's also uh, support. So th this disease hit you six weeks before you got married to Dave. Is that right? Yeah. And I, I'll tell you. Was that a bigger surprise for you or for Dave? I, was, I, I will tell you, there was a part of me that when I went to him and said, I just had, was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. Do you still want to marry me? I literally asked him. And mm -hmm. by his answer, I should have known the kind of partner he would turn out to be. You know, And so that was just a lovely, lovely thing to, to know that we were going this together, that I wasn't going it alone from the beginning. And when I went into the hospital and that whole down, downward spiral, uh, it was so important to have that love and support. Mm -hmm. well, well, um, I'm curious, were you treated at UCSF or was UCSF part of your treatment? No, Kaiser was my treatment. So really? Yeah. How interesting. Wow. And, and um, you were, you were living in San Francisco at the time. So, so yeah. you were treated on Geary. So you were in the hospital on Geary? No, I think it was South San Francisco. Oh, you're in South San Francisco. Okay. Okay. I have, I have Kaiser, uh, I have Bay Area Kaiser Permanente in my <laughs> medical history too. They played a big, they played a big part along with UCSF. So, so yeah. I, I understand the um, the issues of Kaiser, and and I, I'm so happy to hear that you you got good treatment. Um, I assume you got good treatment because you look like you're flourishing now. So they did something right. Yeah, I remember surrendering. That was my biggest aha mm. was just surrender because even though you want to have, and especially me and my personality, the control or the perception mm. of control, that's not mm. the time. And I also did rehab in Vallejo. I'm just remembering that too. So that was, yeah. 
How many how many people in the United States are um, diagnosed with dermatitis? I have seen different uh, statistics as of late. It, it used to be only a handful per million. And now I'm seeing more of like a handful per 100,000. And we don't know if it's because the that there are um, more incidents or better reporting. Does that make sense? It's hard to know. Yeah. But it's yeah, still yeah, yeah. A rare or <laughs> or is it around diagnosis? I mean, is it yeah. do, you, do you think it's just getting diagnosed more readily right now? That's a great question. I'm not sure, you know, whether we're getting better data. I will say that, you know, I know that there's a lot more uh, concerted effort to find out about who has what, especially with COVID, believe it or not, you know, even these trials and things that are looking at patients with autoimmune diseases. I have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know of ones that are looking at dermatomyositis myositis and, or, you know, myositis as part of studies. So it's very uh, encouraging. So we've got three more um, coming up that are going to look a little bit more at the next two sections of your journey, Thriving in Grief. Yeah. Introduce the first one and then you'll come back in and tell us a little bit about the subsequent ones. Yes. So in 2019, I realized that I kind of continued to have challenges with uh, being homebound and continuing to find community and uh, joy and thriving. And I wanted to give back and help others. So I spent a year creating a free two-week virtual summit uh, that I filmed with 60 experts who were all d uh, giving different ways to help others with chronic illness thrive. And this is the trailer from the summit. And interestingly, there were about 1,800 participants that attended. Wow. Fantastic. Wonderful. Great job. this next video I want to share this is sharing my story with rare illness disability and recovery and serves as a powerful reminder to never give up and interestingly a nurse who I played this for during an infusion in late 2019 told me my video could help others get in touch with feelings around their illness that they may not otherwise be able to access and the impact of her statement stayed with me because not only did I need to grieve but I wanted to use my music and art to reach those who also struggle with chronic illness. Keep shining, beautiful one. Beautiful one. Drowning, drowning, drowning. drowning.
needs your light beautiful one all the world is upside down I'm smothered by the sea around me drowning Drowning. Can't dull the ache, poison the pain It taunts my useless body I am drowning. Drowning. drowning I need a sign to remind me who I was Who I still am inside, inside. I need a reason to hold on Let go or swim for my life talked about the grieving project, I'll note that that sparked the grieving project. And that was perhaps the first time I allowed myself to start to grieve my own illness and disability. And that leads to the next track that you're going to hear, which is Tell Me What to Eat. 
And this is a spoken word track from the Grieving Project audiobook that I created during the pandemic. And that's a powerful spoken word audiobook that sets the stage as a grief to music. And in it, I have these four different characters, including me, with four different illness experiences. 16, Rejuvenate. Sixteen, rejuvenate. So I think I'm paleo, but with rice and potatoes and red wine and chocolate. There's paleo and keto, anti-inflammatory, AIP, Mediterranean, vegetarian, candida, whole 30, gluten-free. And some say eat more fat, and some say eat more meat. So how come it's impossible to know just what to eat? If I want to cut out carbs, keto is a fit for me. If I want to heal my gut, I should sure try AIP. But if I can't eat cheese or wheat, maybe paleo's the key. So why is it so friggin' hard to find something to eat? Too many choices. Too many decisions. Everywhere I look, there's another book, another scheme. Another, another scheme. scheme. Too many choices. Too many selections. Can't somebody, somebody just, just tell me what, what to eat? Avoid sugar, avoid alcohol, corn syrup, and caffeine. Avoid grains, legumes, dairy, GMOs, nightshades. Avoid processed foods, additives, trans fats, corn, and soy. And eggs and nuts and seeds. And after that, what's left to eat? Vegetables. Eat lots of vegetables. Eat the rainbow. How much is too much fruit? What if I can't stand fish? So is there a diet just for people with MS? According to this, I'm a lacto-over-vegetarian. Maybe I should go vegan. So what do they call someone who is gluten, dairy, sugar, meat-free, but eats fish? High maintenance. Too many choices. Too many decisions. Everywhere I look, there's another book, another scheme. Another, another scheme! Can't, Can't somebody, somebody just tell me what to eat? Legumes and fruits and nuts and seeds and eggs and fish and grains. Can eat them all if I recall, if I go Mediterranean. But oh, good God, this really hurts my brain. Oh, here's yet another way, another diet, another craze. Completely contradicting what the last one just conveyed. And now bad fats are out, and good fats are so in. But how much coconut and avocado can you really binge? Too many choices, too many decisions. Everywhere I look, there's another book, another scheme. Another scheme. Another. Too many choices, too many selections. Why can't it be easy to get what my body needs? Too many choices, too many decisions. Can't somebody just tell me what to eat? I'm back. Wow. <laughs> what do you eat? Yeah, let's just, yeah, I'm the one who's like, wait, so gluten-free, dairy-free, uh, but I eat lots of vegetables and yes. Yes. Now, there was somebody who didn't get a shout out yet. Alice? Yes. <laughs> yeah, <I did. laughs> she got a shout out in Keep Shining video. She did, but you didn't give her, you gave Dave a shout out, but you didn't give Alice a shout out. And you were very concerned about your caregivers. And that, of course, is a big issue. To what extent are pets caregivers? You want to talk a little bit about that? Oh, sure. Alice is our wire fox terrier. She's an amazing companion. And actually, during these infusions that I was sharing, she sat next to me during each infusion as calm as can be, even to the point where I would get up we didn't even need to leash her. She just, she knew exactly what she was needed there for. It was just beautiful. Wow. Wow. That's, 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 it's pretty special. And I just want to say to the audience, please, uh, if you've got any questions for Lise, please put them in the uh, chat window or the Q and A or wherever you put them. I'm not even sure. And, and they'll come through to me and we'll make sure they get asked. Mm -hmm. So, um, this thriving stage, how did you know when you were ready 
to start healing others and you didn't need to spend so much time healing yourself? So in 2016, when I was living with dermatomyositis for more than eight years, it hit me I had not processed my illness. And perhaps because I was always hiding behind this artist persona, Aedi, I was noting I'm making fantasies and lights and, you know, keeping everything very light. And I had this yearning to be part of something bigger than myself and a need mm -hmm. to give back. And I first had this desire to share my story and then use my gifts living with chronic illness to encourage and inspire others who might be going through something similar. So in, I think it was 2017 or so, I wrote and then 18 published my memoir. And it is called A Light in the Darkness, Transcending Chronic Illness Through the Power of Art and Attitude. Okay, uh -huh. where do we, how do we find this book, by the way? Oh, you can find it on Amazon and okay. uh, anywhere that, you know, books are sold, so to speak. It's also available as an audiobook. But what it is, okay. is it's an inspirational story of the healing power of music and creativity, following your dreams and finding your true purpose. And it answers the central question, what do you do when you're struggling with illness and disability that doesn't go away? Mm. And we saw in that video, um, the middle one, um, that there were times when you were being treated that um, at least your character um, w was was very sad and very depressed, and 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 I mean that was the feeling that came across yeah. from the the emotions that that were being shown through this um, um, yeah. this lens of right the animation and the emotion that came yes. through. Yes, and yeah. it, the irony is, I'll, I'll give you the story that most people don't know. When I wrote that song, it was for an anthem for a production that we were doing in 2018 called Lights in the Darkness. And I gathered, this is after I had interviewed 45 different artists from around the world to share their art and stories on how they were using creativity to heal. And I said, that's how I want to share my book. So I created this opportunity for these uh, videos that I ended up sharing, but also a live production. I wanted to write a song for the live production and that ended up being Keep Shining. And I imagined the world through all of our artists that were creating to heal. It wasn't until I went to the video storyboard that I realized this is my story. I had mm -hmm. never acknowledged and felt what that was like for me to go into the hospital. I shared that, that I had this downward spiral to the point of not being able to move any muscles. I never took it in. So what you're seeing on the video is sort of like a first cut at somebody who was an animator's interpretation of what that must have been like. But the reality is I was actually very up and I did not uh, allow myself to feel you know, what that was like. So seeing Keep Shining was actually also an opening for me to realize that I also need to grieve. That's interesting. I mean, I would have thought that as a as a guitarist, a ukulele player and everything else for years and years, when you lose those motor skills like you did and you couldn't play the guitar, I'm assuming there were times when you couldn't play the guitar because you, you, you didn't have the, the manipulation. That, that must have been incredibly depressing for you. I did not take, I mean, you know, you can see from my journey I, sp I spent so much time being the muse. So when you, this is interesting, I'll share this with our audience. You yes. and I had a conversation and you said, what am I gonna call you? And even that was a question in my head. I wasn't like, just call me Lise because AED is what I put on. That's the hat that I've worn. As AED, I'm only in my head supposed to share the light and the positive. And that's what I thought my fans wanted, you know, to see the right. pretty fascinators, to right. see us walk, you know, when we went to the Grammys, to see us on the red carpet. That's what they want to see. Not, I spent 269 doctor appointments. You see? So I mm -hmm. internalized that. I became AED. And then I had this beautiful thing happen, which was I started integrating my illness into the art. That's why the book happened. So that was step one. 
And then the beautiful thing is that actually it, was, it went further than that, which is this want and need to help others. And that's why I did my summit, as I was showing in the video, sure. where, you know, I had this opportunity to help others. So it really was this opening for me of once I integrated my illness into my art, my path and my purpose were really aligned much more than when I just created fantasy to express right? Because it's beautiful. I'm not, I, I, and actually I've talked to, to people about this, how I don't think I would want to have had all the grieving and all that first, because it would have impacted how and what I wrote in that light period. I'm glad I've had the fantasy and I've actually come almost full circle now because I'm creating a new musical that I'm merging fantasy and my illness. And I'm so excited to be at that place because it's this like recognition that just because it's fantasy or light doesn't mean I have to completely squelch it. You know what I mean? Or suppress it just because I'm on an illness journey now, you know? So let's talk more about this grieving. Um, if you were able to integrate um, your recovery with, with, um, with helping others, with healing, with thriving, um, what are you grieving for? Because it seemed like that that period was not really lost because it, it created something. I love that. I love that perspective. So interesting. So something was missing to me. And despite years of creating songs and albums and musicals and sharing my story and through the tests and treatments and hospital stays and running my summit, I think I spent so much time creating and keeping so busy, just like most of us do by taking our work and making that our whole life that I forgot to grieve. And I think that that's a really big statement because honestly, I think it's almost like you have to hit the, the lowest lows and actually let that in to experience the highest highs. Mm -hmm. So by blocking some part of my life out, because why? Because uh, I didn't, you know, have the capacity at the time. I didn't have the energy. I didn't have any of that to take that in. Part of me, I agree with you, is like, why grieve now? What, what do I still have to do 12 to 13 years later? And ironically, I created this project called The Grieving Project during the pandemic. So here's the situation. I'm creating, I'm finally opening up my heart getting into these stages of grief and then the pandemic's hitting. So on top of it, what, you know, we have so much more to grieve. And in fact, it shaped the way the project developed because we had, you know, my producers in LA, I'm in San Francisco, all of our VO people, our voiceover are all remote. They, I could not attend the studio because I'm homebound and my health would not permit it. Yeah. Um, and this is the studio during March to April of 2020. So the timing of that, or maybe it was June, the timing was like, you know, we're all, everybody's still sheltering. So everything played a role on how this project came to be. Um, and I love that. It's, it's a musical spoken word audio book. And in it, there are these four characters who basically mm -hmm. plunged through 14 stages of grieving and thriving. And, you know, I won't say this, the specific diseases are not as important to me, but Lisa is based on me and my character with a journey with dermatomyositis. Danica is based on a journey with MS. Charlie suffers with something called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, POTS and MCAS. And Brandon has anxiety, depression, and PTSD. And like I said, the most important thing is not the disease, but the emotions that all of us who deal with grief are going through and dealing with chronic illness. And I'll also say most of us don't think in the chronic illness community, we don't think to grieve an illness. It's not like we're losing a loved one, except that I've acknowledged that, yes, we are. We've lost ourselves and that we are not who we were before our diseases took our identity. So, so really, that's that's my answer is maybe the answer is, you know, you need to acknowledge and grieve for who you once were. I cannot go and I haven't traveled in probably three years or something. Part of it is COVID. Part of it is because I've been homebound. That is a big grieving place for me. 
you know, not seeing, I haven't seen my family in two years, two and a half years. Um, so, oh. yeah. So I, I'm going to, there's a couple of things that you raise here. One of them is we have to give a shout out to our MS people because we have an MS, we have a thriving MS virtual group that meets twice a month. And in fact, we're, we're gonna have, we've had one MS performer um, in Solo Arts Hill and we're gonna have another MS performer who's quadriplegic and has done a TED talk coming up in a couple of months. Um, and maybe we get you into that one of those MS virtual groups and you can talk to those folks about whether they're grieving for what, for what they lost. We'd love, we'd love you to do that. I also want to give a shout out um, to Michael Bahovsky, who was another one of our performers yes. who um, has Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And, yes. and, and we're working with, with Michael also in another group. So you, you, hit, um, you hit a lot of points. But there, there's something else that occurs to me, and I know from reading about you, you have a meditation practice. And um, I lived in the Bay Area for a long time. I lived in Marin, and um, I spent quite a lot of time volunteering and attending Spirit Rock. Um, I was a huge, huge fan of Jack Cornfield, Cornfield and, and others. And one of the things that I learned, and I, and I learned it not long before I got diagnosed, and it helped me immensely, was that I needed to stay in the moment. I needed to stay in the present. And that that really got me through um, a lot of my own situation. I had stage three cancer and I had to do a, a lot of treatment. Um, and it seems to me that when you, we talk about this grieving project, we're taking ourselves out of the moment and we're going back. And once we start going back, we start opening up doors I, that maybe I don't, we don't want to walk through. I don't necessarily uh, see it in that perspective. I see it okay. as allowing yourself whatever is coming up at the moment. So you have to be completely super focused on what you're feeling and experiencing at this moment, mm -hmm. not thinking, oh, you know, what didn't I do or what haven't I processed, etc. The music. So I had created workshops using the grieving project and uh, other expressive arts to help us creatively grieve our illnesses. And I've run three of those with the myositis support and understanding group and also reimagine. And what we do is honestly, it's the time and space to sit with what comes up. So a track that you just heard, like, tell me what to eat might be that's in the thriving stages and it might spark joy. It might spark some funny things. It might spark things about, oh my gosh, I relate to because I'm overwhelmed with the diet choices versus a track like Choose, which is actually sort of is my story going through the hospital and people relate to the experience. They relate to the what's coming up in, uh, musically that triggers some emotion. So they're there in that moment. And that's to me what the grieving project is about. Not, you know, necessarily going back and tr having triggers. It's about everybody experiences grief. So it's, it's actually beyond just care partners, caregivers, and, and, um, and people living with chronic illness. All of us deal with grief. And so that, that's my hope, is that it can be that. For I'm so glad you use that term, care partners, because I've been going back and forth with an academic in, in Canada who just wrote a paper on caregivers and he forgot to include care partners and he didn't even realize it was an important term. And I think it's a very important term. So thank you very much for bringing that up. Now, we're coming towards the end and there are some people who would like to know, how are you doing now? Some people wanna know how I'm doing now. So I stopped my infusions, on the physical side I'm talking, <laughs> I stopped my infusions in 2020 because I did not want to take the risk of being at the hospital five days each month to mm -hmm. during COVID. And so I've been managing well and been using, I saw a functional nutritionist to help with uh, you know, diet changes and supplements. 
uh, and I am making sure, like for me, it's very important to get the self-care. And I made a mistake of diving in headfirst into the land of creativity without balancing self-care that pushed me into a flare in 2018. So I've since learned if I do anything, it has to be. And for me, that's usually naps because rest is crucial each day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a, you know, it's an incurable disease. So I always have to look at it as right. I'm getting the best quality of life that I can right now. And that's good enough for me. And, and, you know, and I'm also hearing, I mean, you, you deal with these flares like the MS community does too. Yeah. But, and, and now I'm getting a better sense of what triggers them. So it's a lot. If I have pushed myself and pushed myself for, you know, weeks on end, I, I now realize it isn't just about uh, getting enough rest because then you actually can do, you know, exacerbate to the point of, I don't right. the work going back to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. Right, 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 right. Well, believe it or not, we've almost come to the end. So, and this has been wonderful. And I mean, I hope the audience has enjoyed it as much as I have talking to you and that they've, They've seen this 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 progression, um, and I like I said right at the beginning, it, it's just a perfect example of why we do this show. How the healing arts help you um, deal with uh, conditions that you live with and that you, and the, and that you face, and 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 how you emerge. Um, and in your case, not just emerge, but but triumph, and 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 bring. Um, you're healing and you're thriving to other people, which is which is what we we love to do this at Ancan. That's what we like to do here. Um, I I do want to say that next month, um, for those of you who are regulars, um, we're going to have a wonderful um, composer, pianist, um, who is a care partner, caregiver, and she has looked after two folks with cancer. I'm not going to tell you who because that'll spoil it because we've got to get you in. But she's, she's, she's um, worked with two people very, very close to her. And that's uh, largely what we're going to be talking about. We would love um, for you uh, who are listening to be very generous with the, uh, with, with the tip jar, with the, ang with the marsh tip jar. And, um, oh, one other thing. Um, ANCAN has a great webinar. I put it up um, in the chat window with Valentine's Day in mind. It's a webinar on intimacy. It's going to be run by a, a, an incredible um, urologist, Rachel Rubin, who um, we've actually welcomed before and has spoken to the MS community before. And she'll be here on the 31st of January, next Monday. It's free. Uh, you can register at the link that I put in the window and we'd love to see you there too. And I think that's about it. I've got to go back to Brianna because our time is over. Brianna, come on in. Thank you, Lise. Sorry. Thank you, Lise. <laughs> and thank you for having me. And I'm adapting the grieving project to a musical. So I just wanted people to be aware and be looking out for that. Thanks. <laughs>